like some more. Uh, even if your phone has that manual thing, oh, that's also fine. You can at least see. Yeah, new phones have. Yeah, yeah, a lot of new phones have like OnePlus 5 iPhones and all they have it. Even if your phone has manual thing, it should be good. Okay, cool. So, I think we should get started. Uh, we are in the week two. So last week we've covered a little bit about like basics of composition and uh, uh, what what about lighting and all that. So I'll just quickly do a recap. Uh, so we talked a little bit about exposure, what exposure is, ISO, aperture, hope you remember this, but I'll just uh, quickly walk you through the concepts. So aperture is basically the opening in the lens, right? The, I mean, it's basically how much light you allow into the onto the sensor, right? How much light you want to capture in the program. Uh, so it's defined by the F number. And last time there was some question about the math of the F number, so I tried to look it up. Uh, you're actually right, it's a, it's a geometric progression of root 2. Now the reason for that is, like, the f-stop number is given by focal length by diameter. So it's actually the diameter of the diaphragm, right? Uh, so when you're actually setting, like, when, say for example, the, these are the f-stop numbers, 1, 1.42, 2.84, 5.6 and 8. So the more you go, you're actually uh, reducing like the amount of light by half. So basically you are reducing the area of the circle by half. So area we know is pi r square and all that. So once you do that then the equation comes out to be like root 2 times of the f-stop number, right? So that's where the whole thing is about. So if you are, say for example your f-stop number is 5.6 and then if you go one step, so basically you are allowing more light then you go, you increase, you open the aperture so the area increases, so that becomes 8. And if you're reducing the amount of light, then it becomes 4. So, it, I mean, the, this, it can't be 3.96, so they just round it up to 4. So that's the math hope that answers the question. Uh, we talked a little bit about the depth of field, like by changing the aperture, right, what happens? So you're actually increasing and narrowing the depth of field. So depth of field is nothing but how long, like how far is the, how far are the objects from your focal point are in focus, right? So you just take this and then draw a circle. So the diameter of that is the focal length, right? Uh, sorry, a depth of field. Uh, the effect of depth of field and then what shutter speed is, you're basically freezing the action and then blurring the action. Uh, this is the analogy which we explained last time, right? So imagine there's a bucket. This is the ISO, which is the quantity of light it can capture. And then the width of the pipe, uh, the diameter of the pipe is the aperture. And then you're shutting in closing the valve, so that's how much time do you open it for and close it, that's the shutter speed. Right, so your light, the amount of light you're capturing depends on all these three factors. Okay, uh, rules of composition, we talked about rule of thirds. So when you divide the frame into three cross three grade, try to be, try to place your main subjects on these points. And uh, the rule of symmetry, uh, leading lines, and then, I mean, if you have any questions, uh, sorry. Oh, no, I was wondering, no, I was asking if this is a recap of... Yeah, this is a recap, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, will you be sharing these slides? I already shared last time. I mean, I didn't attend last time, so maybe you can share it. Uh, if, yeah, if, I think it's already shared. Should we send it? If you accept it, then what you should do. But I'll share it again. I'll share it on your okay. Uh the concept of leading lines, try to capture like the lines which actually lead to your subject. So that's the leading line and frame within frame, golden triangles, right? Color composition, try to capture the complementary ones, like the ones opposite are complementary. So try to capture those as much as possible. Uh, fill the frame, leaving negative faces. So I'm, quick, I'm quickly skimming through all of this. And then uh, we talked about lighting. So what is the direction? So lighting, there are three different dimensions. One is the direction, it's front, side and back. And then we talked about what is the most difficult and what are the effects and all of that. Uh, type of light which is hard and soft. So when, like especially during the mornings, like when the light source is not too bright, you basically get like softer lights where there are not too many shadows or highlights and all that. And then there's hard light which is like midday sun, right? And then, uh, yeah, today there's a lot of soft light because of the clouds and all that. So you can see suddenly it becomes ambient light. And then when the clouds clear off, then it becomes like hard light again, right? And then the color, like cool versus warm. Uh, okay, so that's that. And uh, we should quickly move to the... So today we'll cover mostly on the 
camera controls and you know there was a lot of questions about it should like we need practical experience right so we talk we'll talk a little bit about what control is what and how do you do it so let's start with uh, types of cameras right so this is a quick timeline of how the cameras evolved so this was 8040 the first camera and uh, the last time i showed a picture that was shot maybe with this one uh, it was shot in 1827 uh and then you can see the whole transition into the smartphone so the first slr came in 1930 and then the digital one is i think 90s around and then the dslr came so dslr is not in this spectrum but most of the that like most of the cameras here i see are dslrs i guess yeah uh so let's see what is the difference right so the most basic one is the point and shoot uh, these are the cheapest and uh, they don't have any interchangeable lenses or anything uh they they have minimal number of manual controls like you you can't set you know uh, i mean there's a lot of there's not too many apertures and all of those controls are not they are very limited so this the main purpose is you just click and then expect the best outcome out of the camera so you can't expect a lot of uh, manual controls with it and uh, in terms of zoom like they don't have much i mean it's mostly digital they have like 3x kind of optical zoom but i mean now these ones are getting uh, uh they getting more advanced so they you have like better optical zooms and all of that and then there's advanced compact um this is the next level which has a this has a lot of manual controls right like you can set your apertures and uh shutter speed iso and lot of other settings like white balance and things like that so you can set all of them but again you can't use like different lenses you can't remove the lens and then put a different lens on it so it's still limited again last time we talked about it right like convenience versus control So the more towards the control you move to, the camera gets expensive, and then it gives you more uh, flexibility in terms of how you click and how you want to capture the picture. Uh, then DSLRs. So this we talked about like SLR is basically the single lens reflex, right? So there's a prism, then the light goes through it. There's a mirror which reflects onto the prism, and then you can see through the viewfinder. Uh, so the more, so most of the basics, so even in DSLRs, there are different levels. There is a entry level. So if you, I, I have a lot like I know a lot about Canon because I use a Canon. Uh, I think the more the number, like this Canon 1100D, 1300D, more the number, the lesser the price. And then the lesser the number, so this is 5D Mark IV. I think this camera is close to two and a half lakhs. Uh, maybe even lesser, yeah, uh, around two lakhs, I guess. So the lesser the number, the price goes up. And it's all how is what is the sensor. what quality is the built so this is all metal body i think aluminum and most of the entry levels one entry level are all plastic uh and they are much heavier also and then in terms of quality you get amazing quality in low light right with all of this and then even the lenses there are better lenses manufactured for these that you can get uh, we'll we'll have i have a sec section on the lenses too so we can see what are the different types <coughs> of lenses and what do you use in all of that uh so how does the type of body matter uh, it's just the more sturdy is it? it's yeah it's it's more durable so it, i mean you can shoot in like different weather conditions so people with these cameras right so you just uh, you should have seen that holy pictures and all that in varanasi like it's there a lot of pictures in what under underwater and all they use this one only but they have a case but still it is weather proof and just in basic rain and all you can pretty much shoot it right and it's also more like when you click also it's more uh, stable and it, it it doesn't it has better stabilization and all of that uh, but yeah i mean it it doesn't matter too much it's mostly what's inside it uh the sensor or i think these are like very good sensors and they're also the frame so i don't have it in this one but maybe next time i can cover so there are different so typically what happens is right like when you when you see when you see through the viewfinder you see the full thing but when it actually gets captured on the sensor it's actually 95% of what you see so these ones are all full frame so whatever you see is what you get there's no crop at all so that also matters quite a lot now uh, cool so the next one these are pretty new these are mirrorless uh, okay with the dslrs you can have like multiple lenses and based on what you want to shoot what you're shooting you can keep changing the lenses and we'll get to the types of lenses and all soon uh with mirrorless so it has the best of both worlds right it's uh, compact the problem with dslr it's very bulky like you can see right it's heavy and with the lenses it gets even more uh, bulkier uh with this one they have interchangeable lenses so these are called mirrorless so mirrorless is basically they don't have those mirrors it's directly uh, electronic 
sensor and all that. So you don't have a mirror and then whatever gets on the sensor you can see it on the viewfinder. So viewfinder is also digital on this. So there's not too many uh, components in terms of optics and more. So it's this you get it up to, I mean the entry level SLRs you get around 26, 27,000. You get a Canon 1300D maybe. This one's you go up to 40,000, the basic one. Uh, this one I think is 43 or something. That is a little lesser. Uh, so with this one, you can have uh, interchangeable lenses. So you can have, like you see this, uh, is it? yeah, 1855, right? So you can have a different kind of lens. You can have like an 18, 135. And again, the focal length, the more, last time we talked about it, right? The effect of focal length, where the higher you go, the narrower your field of view. So say for example, I'm clicking, clicking you, then from here if I take it with 18, I can get all of all of you, but if I just want to focus on you, then I can zoom in and then go to a higher focal length, then you can get it. So that's, uh, you can keep changing that. Uh, and then of course, the smartphone cameras too, right? And they're not bad. I mean, these days, smartphone cameras have a lot of manual <coughs> controls and the portrait modes and whatnot. So they're pretty, I mean, you can get very good uh, pictures with just with the smartphones. Uh, yeah, in terms of comparison, this is your SLR, then this is a mirrorless, and then that's an advanced compact. So you see the size difference. Uh, so it's it's basically that, right? So this is more control, that's more compact, more convenient, and uh, it, you're just trading off flexibility and all that. And a lot of people have this camera, like a lot of people have this question like, okay, it's fine, but I want to buy a camera, so which one should I buy? So it depends on uh, the multiple factors. One is what exactly are you interested in, like what level of interest you have, what do you want to photograph, and uh, what is your budget, that's important, right? I mean, with SLR, you just buy the camera and that's not it, you keep investing on it, like you, okay, suddenly you feel I want to go buy a better lens, so I, you buy it. So it keeps increasing, it depends on how much budget you have to buy it, and uh, how much control versus how much convenience you have, right? So if you're just like a travel kind of a <coughs> photographer and you don't want too many manual controls, for me, it's all, I want a compact one. So I just go for a compact, maybe a mirrorless, if budget is not your constraint. So it depends on uh, what you want and how much you, what you want to click, uh, how much you want to spend and all of that. And uh, the last thing I added because, so this happens quite a lot with me. So a lot of my friends use Canon and that's what pushed me into buying Canon because I can borrow lens and use them, use them right? So that's why I thought, okay, let's go for Canon. That's my entry point and a lot of, my friends at that time, they were all having Canon. So we used to change, exchange lenses and you. So that's also one important factor to consider. Uh, and there's, I mean, both are pretty much the same, right? It's like Windows versus Apple. I mean, both, it's, it's the same, but it depends on what you want. Uh, so this is a quick cheat sheet of what type, like what type of things you want to photograph and what, you, what camera fits best for your needs. So if you want just like close-ups and flower shots and all of that, then even point and shoots, there's a mode called macro mode, so you can get like really good uh, uh, close-up shots of flowers, insects, whatnot. And then, uh, of course, DSLR, you can go across the range, but the problem with DSLR is it's not compact, so it's very, when you're going on a trek and all, then you have to carry it all the time, so it's bulky. All that problem comes into picture. So for travel and street photography, it's better to go for like a compact ones. And most of these photographers, right, they have like multiple cameras. They have a DSLR, they have like, uh, a mirrorless, they have a point and shoot, so they have multiple variations of the cameras. Then, uh, if you want to do like wildlife and all, then it's mostly DSLR and mirrorless because you need like a high zoom and all of that, so you need interchangeable lenses. Uh, if you're just clicking your dinner for your Instagram and Facebook, then your point and shoot and smartphone should be good enough. Uh, so, yeah, I think the main point is you just start small. I mean, you get an entry level or semi-pro or mirrorless, whatever, you start small and then the moment you feel that, okay, I'm hitting like my limit in terms of the the equipment is limiting my creativity, then you just go for it. So I think it's, I mean, it's just, it depends on philosophy. Some people just buy the high-end one and then they eventually get there. But it depends on how you see it, right? And then it's, I think the practice, then trying to get hold of your like con camera controls and all that is, is more important. Uh, cool, still here, any questions? That's good. So let's look at lenses. Uh, so most of these slides from now on, it's uh, focused on DSLR. And I tried to make it generic in terms of controls and all, but it's mostly focused on Canon because I have a practical experience with it. 
uh, but it, sh it should be pretty much the same. Like most of these controls are across all the different cameras, and even for your smartphone manual controls and all. Um, so lenses, these are, I mean, lenses are important, right? Because that's what helps you to capture. That's what captures the light and then gets onto the sensor. So it depends on what you want to shoot. And most of the lenses are designed for specific type of usage, right? So the most basic one is called a standard or prime lens, uh, <coughs> which is it's a, so prime. Its standard is it just has one focal length, right? So you can't zoom in, you can't do anything. So it's just 50 mm, and 50 mm is actually what your eye sees. So your eye, when when you see it with a 50 mm, your eye exactly sees the same field of view. 50 mm is exactly closest to the eye. So it's mostly that 35 to 85. These are called standard because they are closest to how human eye sees uh, the world, right? And these you can use it for general purpose. I mean, you can use it for portraits any daily shoot and shoot and all of that. Now, the good thing about this is they can have, they can go up to the aperture value of like 1.8. So they can, even in low light, you get amazing portraits. So this is an example. This was a shot in one of my friend's wedding. Uh, so this was shot with 85 mm. And uh, this was like, it was hardly lit. I mean, in low light, so this was shot in two, I think, two or 2.8. Uh, you get pretty good low light performance, right? And this is what the closest, your uh, closest to your, uh, the vision, actual vision of the human eye. Uh, there are multiple ranges, like 50 mm is the cheapest in Canon, it costs around 4,800, oh sorry, 8,400 if I'm not wrong. And then uh, 85 mm is like 25,000, so there's a huge difference. Uh, and this is very, you get pretty good quality with this one. Nik Nikon has it, a lot of, uh, Sony, even Sony has a 50 mm now. Mm. Then the next thing is telephoto, and most of the lens is <coughs> determined by like the focal length, right? So this is 35 to 85, but most of the prime lenses have fixed focal length, so you can't zoom in or zoom out, whatever. It's just standard. Uh, this is so these kind of lenses are zoom lenses. These range from uh, these are called telephoto. They range from 85 to 135, uh, and then this is so there are different levels of uh, telephoto also. So there's the short telephoto which is 85 to 135 which is pretty good for portraits and if you want to if you're walking on a street and then you want to shoot some paparazzi and candid shots this is like pretty good uh, then there is medium which is uh, sports and action photography which is close right so maybe uh, you're watching a badminton game and then you're sitting in like the third row then this is pretty good like 135 to 300 but if you are in a cricket stadium and then you want to, so you see these right on the boundary, right? There are these huge cameras. So they are all super telephoto. So they are they are close to 500 mm minimum. And the lens itself will cost you like 4 lakh. Uh, these are like white, huge lenses. And uh, if you observe, there is this, right? So this is basically for mounting on the tripod. So what happens is, the lens is so heavy that the moment you attach it to the camera, the center of gravity shifts. So you can't mount the, the tripod just tumbles down, so you have to mount. So it's, it just says that how complex the mechanism and optics and the build is also pretty, like they're very heavy. I mean, the camera weight itself can go up to like six, five to six kg with these lenses. Uh, if you want to shoot like the fast sports and astronomy and wildlife and all, you can go more than 300. Uh, and then I think the maximum is like 600, 500. It depends on the make, right? Uh, yeah, this was shot with 300. Uh, the cheapest telephoto is 75-300. Uh, that's around maybe 18, 9, 20,000 maybe. Uh, this was shot with 300. But the thing is, the the higher the price, the better the low light performance. So in a cricket stadium, you don't know how the light is, right? There's like stadium lights, but it's not brightly lit. So you have to have like a very good, and it has to be fast also because people are running and it's very fast moving. So your lens has to be very sensitive to light and it has to be fast. So that's where the whole uh, price keeps increasing. It's just the performance in low light and how low the aperture can go to, or how wide the aperture is, right? Mm. And then the next is macro. Uh, this can range from 85 to, oh, sorry. I think it's a copy paste mistake, but anyways. Uh, so macros, they have different ranges. Like they have a, I apologize for the content. But uh, these are mostly for close-ups, like if you are shooting insects and uh, the quality of this is like they can just magnify dimensions of a smaller object, like say for example, you are taking like the key keyboard, sh shots on the keyboard, uh, sorry, you are taking a photograph of the keyboard, right? So you set it on the macro mode and suddenly the perspective, it changes, it, it basically makes smaller objects look bigger, like for this one. 
So this is a bug, and this I shot it with point and shoot in the macro mode. So it's not DSLR, it's basic point and shoot. You just put to the macro mode, and then the only problem is you have to go really close. And by the time that will fly off. <laughs> so uh, the same thing, right? Like the more the focal length, the farther away you can be, and then you can click the pictures. Uh, with the normal point and shoot macro, the only advantage is you basically have to move and then come back. Uh, then the wide angle, so this one is a wide angle, this is a 10, 14, 10, 18. This is a wide angle lens, you'll see the difference when you see with that and then when you see with this one, you see the difference. So basically the view becomes wider, right? Like uh, these are very good for landscapes, like if you're shoot, so you would have seen uh, pictures in, in the interior, right? Like apartments and all of that. So these are all shot with uh, wide angle. So see the 24, 35 or 8 to 24. So this is a fisheye. Fisheye, the name, uh, it inherits the name from actually the vision of a fish. So when you, like when the fish is in the water, the vision is basically this. So it can see almost everything, right? So the, it's, it's so wide, it basically sees uh, maybe like easily 190 degree field of view, uh, sorry, one, not 180, uh, 170 degree field of view. So it's really wide and if you want to take like really wide landscapes and the problem with this is it's very, so with this one I rarely use it because I don't know how to handle the dimensions. So if you see it messes up the whole, you see the dimension, it just stretches the corners. So you have to be very careful in how you compose the picture and uh, <coughs> it just makes things smaller, right? So this is, they were not very far from me, they were hardly like maybe standing there. So it just Further. So it's exactly opposite to the micro. So micro basically increases the dimensions. This like this reduces the dimensions. So and this is a wide angle. This is again 18 maybe. Uh, this was shot in 14, 14 mm. This with this one. And then there are some specialist lenses which and you would have seen photographs like this. So this is a tilt shift. So this is a tilt shift lens. Uh, these are also very expensive, they go in the range of lakhs. Uh, and then there are infrared, if you want to capture night vision, uh, sorry, night uh, dark, like in the dark. So there's infrared uh, lenses. And then there's soft focus, so this just gives move some movies, like you see these effects in a lot of movies, right? Like there's a dreamy, soft kind of effect. So these are all the soft focus. Sorry? Can you go back to the picture? This one? Yeah, what is, what is a tilt shift lens? So this, this is, it, it just, uh, it, it looks like a artificial thing, right? It's a miniature thing. So it just, it's for that effect. And this effect, you can use it on your phone also. There are some apps which gives you like tilt shift. So this is actually tilt shifts and this is the one. I mean, it's actually normal shot. But if you shoot it with a tilt shift lens, then it just makes it miniaturized. It looks like it's a, it's a artificially created world, right? Um, that's that. And uh, okay, that's all about the lenses, right? So again, it depends on what you want to shoot, right? So for example, <coughs> if you want to shoot architecture, you go for a wide angle. Uh, if you want to shoot like this kind of things, you go for a macro. If you want to shoot a wildlife and all, you go for a tele and then <coughs> standard ones. I mean, 50 mm is a very basic one and it's a fantastic lens. I, if, you're, if you want to get into photography, I would definitely recommend this one. Mm. And then, uh, so a lot of these lenses, right, if you see, there is something called as a <coughs> image stabilizer, right? Sorry, yeah, so there's a setting which is image stabilizer, so this, this is the difference. So this one is shot with the image stabilization off, and this is with image stabilization. So you see the difference. There's obviously a small shake, right, when you click it, uh, your, the camera shakes a little bit. So the lens, it automatically corrects uh, with the optics, it corrects that... Uh, uh, blur and then it gives you a sharper picture. So a lot of lot of zoom lenses. I mean, this doesn't matter when you're going wide angle because you and in in bright light because you're on higher shutter speed and then the shake doesn't matter. But it matters a lot when you're going for like longer focal length <coughs> because even a small shake just messes up the whole picture. So why do they give the option? I mean, it should be on always, right? Mm -hmm. mm, a good question, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I'm not sure actually I because people even the tripod it's not really required. No, even tripod also you yeah, yeah, yeah. because of wind shape. Wind or even if it clicks then that shake. So most of the time it's on and I've never seen anyone. Low light conditions. 
It's waiting for low light conditions. It will stabilization. No, even normally also. So this is very brightly lit, right? So even this one even stabilization. But do lenses have that? option? I thought it is auto on. It's the only. Yeah, no, it's always on. Yeah, but you can off. You can set it off. There is one. Yeah. yeah. You can switch it off. So this is off. Even the lens. Every lens should have it. So in Nikon, it's a it's a VR yeah. vibration detection. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. the same yeah. same feature, but feature, feature but it's button to turn it off. Yes. Yeah. I'll get back to you. That's a good question, but I don't know. I have never seen. Sometimes the camera body also has image. Yes, a few cameras have it. So start from the front. So even um, so earlier, right, the whole aperture control and all, it used to be on the lens. If you see the older uh, FM10s and all, there's a knob. But now so maybe if the camera has it, then you don't need it on the lens. So you turn it off. Uh, just to guess. Yeah, I think it's it's still the lens does the magic. The camera doesn't do anything. So it's it's just that how many features you're offloading of the lens. So maybe the lens becomes simpler or it's easier to manufacture or whatever. Uh, but I I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, I've never seen anyone click click switch it off and click. I never I would never switch it off. Now. So they switch it on the uh, start time. You know the start time. They switch it off the vibration definitely because focusing. No, even then you need it. No, they don't use a uh, stabilizer. So because it will, every time it will take one photograph, right? Mm -hmm. Every few seconds, like let's say 30 seconds, it will take one one photograph. <coughs> so every uh, it will uh, mean uh, the vibration will, it will take out of focus also. I think for that. Okay, that maybe I'm not yeah. sure. But I'll get back to you. So we also get these filters, right? Uh, yes, are I you going to cover them. Uh, I thought of ignoring it. Next session, I'll cover it. So I'll take right. filters. I have kit. You have a kit? Awesome. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I can cover the filters in the next one. But the, with the filters, like if you showed it in Grono, so you can do it in post processing, most of the filters. But I can I can cover it in the next session. Uh, <coughs> you said about the fastness of the lens. Yeah. That? Uh, fast is okay. So that's a good question. So if you are shooting in low light and then the object is moving fast, right? Now with the low light to get the right amount of light into the camera, you either use a slow shutter speed. Or you open the aperture really big, right? Now the problem is with the lenses. If you look at the lens, uh, so it's written here, right? One is to four point five and five point six. So if you look at it, it's written one, four, one yeah, is yeah. to four point five, five point six. So with the with the minimum, so at ten mm, the aperture can only go up to four point five, and if you are doing eighteen mm, the aperture can only go up to five point six. So even if you want to go down to 1.8 or anything, it can't go. So it's a limitation of the lens, mm -hmm. right? Now, and the image object is moving fast, so you can't open the aperture wide, mm -hmm. and you still want to capture it without the blur. Mm -hmm. So you need a better. So that's what the quickness of the lens. So when I say fast lens, it's basically that, like how low can the aperture go, and then how low light, how sensitive it is to the low light, like how how better it can capture in low light. Okay. So. Good. The more expensive the lens, the better it gets. So 50 mm, it can go up to 1.8, but the problem is it's fixed, right? So you can't zoom in. So in sports, I can't use any of that. In wildlife, also I can't use it. So okay. get it? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Basically, the ratios between the two is too like per yeah, yeah, right. the length. Uh, how? Correct. Yeah. So how? I mean, <coughs> it's, and also it, it's a shutter speed, right? So if you want to allow more light, then if the object is fast moving, you can't open it a long time. You will get a blur. So if you want to freeze it, then you have to go a high shutter speed, and then it has to allow me to go low in the aperture, and then I can click faster. So that's the thing. It's all that exposure triangle. It basically determines how much light and what shutter speed and all of that can control. So we'll look at it. Um, we ha I have a session on the modes also, like what are the different <coughs> modes. You have the knob on the top, right? Different modes on the camera. Mm. So the one which I have, that's an 18-135. So that's a it's a little bit of wide and tele both. Uh, this is a telephoto lens. And then I'm sure there are other lenses too. You can take out the cameras. You can try the settings. Mm, okay, so we've covered cameras. We've covered lenses. Now the most important thing is how to hold it. Uh, this is a very bad way to hold because the moment you click, you do this. So it's it's very it, it, it's weird. I mean, it, it's not good for a sharp image. So typically, how you hold it is can I have the camera? So you rest your camera like this, and then you hold it, right? So you 
you are always listing. And then if you want to zoom, you are using these fingers to zoom. Then same thing with filter, like focus and all of that. So any lens, if it's a zoom lens, it has a zoom ring. This is a zoom ring, which is trying to adjust its 80, 18 or 55. So you will, the more you are, your field of view is narrower, right? And then the lesser you are, the field of view is wider. And then it has the focus ring. So this is generally locked if it's in autofocus, but if you shift to manual, then you can rotate this. So you can uh, you can try it. I mean, if you if you just maybe in the next like the next slide, I have the focus thing. Just try to switch to manual, and then zoom, and then try to use the focus. So focus makes your image sharper. So if you can maybe you can try it. So yeah, these are different, and there are different ways. Like if you if you're like sleeping down, and then how do you hold it? So I can send you an article. There's a very detailed article about how to hold the camera in different <coughs> positions and all of that. And some people rest it on the shoulders like this. Like if you've seen people just do this, it's more it's for more stability. It's not style, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely different. So even this one. So when you're sitting down, then it's always good to rest it on the knee, so that you're because. It shakes. This is weird, right? So it, there's a possibility of shaking. So the main thing is you have to reduce the whole uh, shake while shaking. Uh, and if it's low light and as you said, it's there's windy conditions, then you use a tripod. Uh, and there are multiple like uh, there are multiple <coughs> places you use a tripod. One is and most of these action sports they have a tripod. You can't you can't hold it. Like even with wildlife, a lot of people. If you are if you are really good at it, then you just I mean you just click it without the shake. But a lot of people use tripods in the boats, <coughs> and if it's high zoom, and if you are going really close, like if you are uh, clicking insects and all of that, plus people go really close, they use a tripod. Uh, yeah, so night shots. If it's uh, if the shutter is open for a really long time, then also use tripods, <coughs> right? Mm, okay, now we'll talk about focus. Maybe you can just try out these settings. I just uh, give some time. But there, on every lens, there is a focus thing, right? And sometimes these settings are on the camera also. Right? You can set it. If the the higher the uh, the better the camera, it just has it on the camera itself. Uh, so you have uh, you have like an autofocus. So AF is autofocus. MF is manual. It's yeah, so this is already I said, right? So there is a focus ring, and then there is a uh, zoom ring. Where is the zoom ring? Because this is the prime, is it? Okay. Yeah, this is 28 mm, so it doesn't have a zoom. But there is a zoom ring, and then there is a focus ring. So if you switch to manual, then you try to look at it and then adjust the focus. Switch to manual. Everyone is shaking me up. You're the subject. <laughs> Maybe next time we should get a subject. This is good. You can find out the camera. Yeah, you can point the camera. Project even even on the screen, right? You try to focus on this. You can keep changing. Yeah. 